Well, we are in this series right now, This Is That, where we're dealing with some areas of Christianity that are very, very misunderstood. People think it's this, and it's actually not this. It's, it's really that. And if they understood what it was, they'd realize, you know what, I really want that. Like, I don't like this, but I want that, and that's very valuable to my life. But the problem is, anytime something is misunderstood in your life, you'll tend to criticize it, you'll even make fun of it. And so we want to explain some areas. Now, the book of Acts, for us, is a church history book. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what we call the gospel in the Bible. That's the story of Jesus, his birth to his death. The book of Acts is the history book for how the church began. So it picks up at the death of Jesus and kind of goes on and tells the story of the disciples and the apostles, what happened to them and how they started, how they established the church. Now, one of the things that the book of Acts begins with is what we call the birth of the church, which was when Jesus gave the gift that he promised. In the gospel, Jesus told the disciples, I promise you I'm gonna give you a gift, and this, this is the gift that you need to pull off Christianity, and the gift was his spirit, the power of his spirit in their life. Because the thing is, if you try to pull off Christianity without the Holy Spirit and his power in your life, you're gonna be frustrated and you're not gonna get it right and it's gonna get ugly and, and it's gonna get you know, just, just dead and lifeless. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to pull off Christianity. It does not work in your own ability, your own effort. There's gotta be a relationship with him. So when the Holy Spirit shows up on the scene, things begin to happen and people didn't quite understand what was going on and so people got very critical and even began to make fun of them. And it says, we'll pick up in Acts chapter 2, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Like, I don't get what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. And some even made fun of them. They made fun of them because they didn't get it. And they said, here's what's going on. They're drunk. They've had too much wine. So Peter stands up with the 11, raises his voice, and addresses the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in San Diego and North County and Southern California, <laughs> let me explain this to you. And that's been the goal of this month, is I'm trying to explain some areas of Christianity that many people misunderstand and struggle with. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is that. This is that. It's where we got the series title. Again, there are a lot of people who are staying away from this because they don't understand it's actually that. It's like, it's like saying, I hate basketball. Why? I don't like getting tackled. No, that's football. <laughs> Wrong sport. And there's a lot of people doing that with Christianity. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So we got people making decisions about Christianity based on assumptions, based on myths, based on misunderstanding. So week number one, we dealt with the Holy Spirit. Last week, we dealt with worship, praise and worship, why we have music in church. Like, why do we begin every service with worship? I actually got an email this week I'd love to share with you uh, from a young girl in our church, married, uh, who sent me a note about the message last week. She said, I just want to send a note and say thank you for the message. I've continued to reflect on what you said in referencing worship through the times when life gets you down and you have no answers. This was so true for me this past year after my brother unexpectedly passed away. I remember he passed away on a Friday night and just 36 hours later, all I could think about was getting to church to worship and cling to faith. Looking back, I know I would be in a different place than I am now if I would not have stuck close to God and his word during this time of grief. My mom and I copied down on Post-its each of the scriptures in the back of our Freedom Small Group book about dealing with a broken heart, and we put them around our house. When I thought the pain could not get any worse, I felt comfort and peace in between it all. So hard to explain to someone that has never gone through it, but it made such a strong, positive impact on my life that my walk with Christ will never be the same again. Honestly, as your pastor, there's nothing I would rather have in your toolbox than the tool of worship because it'll get you through some of the most difficult seasons of life. If you missed last week, we archive all of our messages on our website, YouTube, iTunes, and check it out. Very foundational to us as a church. Next week, we're gonna deal with the number one area for why people in America stay away from the church and it's money. It's not God, it's money. It's their, it's their idea of what they think in regards to church and money. And so we're gonna take an honest look. What does the Bible actually say about it versus what have we seen and heard and what's you know, been on TV and how has this message got so 
twisted. Today, I want to deal with something that, that honestly, many people misunderstand in the church today, and we have a lot of different views on it, and people make fun of it, and they criticize it, and, and many of you have your own view on it, and it's the subject of healing. What does the Bible actually say about people being healed, meaning supernaturally healed of sickness or disease? What does the Bible actually teach on this subject? What, what does it actually say? Well, there's two approaches, kind of modern approaches today that I, that I believe are both wrong, I know they're both wrong, that have kind of twisted what people think, and it's one of the reasons why many people are confused on this subject. The first approach that we see out there is called the confessionist approach, the confessionist. This is the hyper-faith movement. It's the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it movement where I, I can just say whatever I wanna say and God's gonna do it. Like, let there be a red Corvette in my driveway. Let there be a red Corvette. There's not a red Corvette in my driveway, but that's, that's kind of where this movement went. And they even have gone so far to say that if you're sick, it's because you're in sin because you don't have enough faith to, to command yourself out of sickness. Now, here's the problem with this movement. Our confession is very, very important. It is absolutely critical, the words you use and the words that you speak in regards to your faith journey. But what you have to understand is our words don't have creative power. They have agreeing power. I can't create with my words. Only God can create with his words. I can't create. I can't say, let there be a red Corvette, and all of a sudden, I create a red Corvette. My words do not have creative ability. They have agreeing power. So it's critical that my words come into agreement with God. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, then you will ask what you will, and it will be done. Why? Because your words are agreeing now. They're in alignment with him. You're agreeing with his plan for your life, and that's where your confession is very, very powerful. The second approach is the sensationist approach. Sensationists believe that miracles in the Bible happen exactly the way you read about them happening. Like all through the book of Acts, all through the gospel, the miracles that you read about happen exactly the way that you read about them happening, but they don't happen anymore, meaning that when the last apostle in the book of Acts died, miracles stopped. So this is a kind of a minority theology out there. When the last apostle, the last disciple died, supernatural miracles, healing, all of it ceased. God has not done anything else in the last 2,000 years since the last disciple died. Now, the problem is I've never met a Christian who doesn't believe that God still heals, that God still does miracles. And in fact, if God's done at least one miracle in the last 2,000 years, then we know that this, this doctrine is, is false and it doesn't work. But here's the problem that so many of us have. We've all had personal experiences in this area. And that's why the views on healing have gotten all over the map, because we've all had personal, we've all seen God come through and do incredible things when we've prayed, and we've all buried people we loved and we prayed. So we've got these personal experiences. We all have disappointments in this area. And the danger is to try to create a belief system off of your personal experience. So what I want to do today is let's look at the Bible. Let's look at what the Bible has to say on the subject. The clearest teaching in all of the Bible on sick people getting well through prayers in the book of James. James says in chapter 5, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Meaning that if you have trouble in your life, prayer can change it. That's what that means right there. Prayer works. Prayer can actually change the trouble in your life. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. And then it adds this detail and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And we're going to do that at the end of the service today. We're doing it at the end of every service this week. And we're going to have our elders and pastors and leaders at the stage, at the altar here, and they are gonna pray for people who are sick at the end of our service, and we're gonna, we're gonna believe God that they will be made well, and we're gonna anoint people with oil. If you, if you ask for the oil, we're gonna anoint you with oil. And, and let me explain this. There's nothing magical about oil. There's nothing, it's not a magical potion. Oil is simply symbolic of the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like communion is symbolic of what Jesus did on the cross and water baptism is symbolic, the water doesn't save you. It's simply symbolic of a process that we go through. Again, there's nothing magical about the oil. It's symbolic. But we're just gonna, as we've done every week, we're gonna apply the scripture. 
Last week, we ended the service with worship. This week, we're gonna end the service with our elders and leaders praying for the sick. And it says, and the prayer offered in faith. And that's what I wanna talk about today, the faith, faith. Because what we're gonna realize is faith is not an instantaneous thing. Faith is actually a journey, a process. will make the sick person well. Now, the word well is a Greek word for healing that, that basically is limited to physical healing. It, it's, just, it, it's a condition going on in your life that God heals. It's the Greek word sozo. The Lord will raise them up, it says. And then it goes on to say, uh, if they have sinned, now, that's interesting twist to this teaching because we're teaching on healing here. We're teaching on sick people getting well, and then all of a sudden, James throws this curveball about sin. Like, it's not sin in my life. I'm sick. That's what's going on. Like, I, like, I don't need to talk about sin. I need to be healed. I, I got sickness, but this is important too. This, this is part of the process, part of the journey. If they have sin, they will be forgiven. Now, to understand this, you have to understand God's view of sin. And the problem is many of us grew up in churches where we were taught the wrong view of sin. We, you know, we, we would come in these hellfire churches where sin is this evil, horrible, nasty, you filthy sinner. I can't believe you. God hates sinners. God hates sin. And, and, and the whole, you don't understand sin according to the Bible. The problem is sin is not just the evil things you do. Sin is evil. Sin is the evil things we do with our life. But let me say it like this. Sin can also be the good things you do if it's not the right thing. Because God's view of sin is very different than our view of sin. God's view of sin is to miss the mark. It means you're aiming the wrong direction. So if God says, I want you to aim your life this direction, and you're aiming your life this direction, you may be doing good things with your life, but God says you're living in sin because you're not aimed the right direction. Like, this is the direction I want you to go with your life, not this direction. So how does God approach sin? Well, again, it's not you filthy sinner, you're, you're horrible, I cannot believe you, what's wrong with you? No, God's approach to sin is repentance. And repentance is not this ugly, harsh, mean word. Repentance means to change your mind, or in other words, to re-aim. So if God is saying sin is to miss the mark, I'm aimed at the wrong target, repentance means to aim at the right target. Now, that doesn't sound that horrible, does it? Sounds very different than the way we heard sin and repentance growing up in church. Like, I heard sin and repentance is like, you filthy, evil sinner. What's wrong with you? Repent so God doesn't strike you dead. That's what I grew up in. And when you understand, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says sin just means you're aimed at the wrong target, and repentance just means you aim at the right target. You have to understand that to understand this whole teaching on healing. So if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, this is a different Greek word than the one we just read about the sick person being made well. See, this Greek word is much more than just a physical miracle. This is a total healing. Body, soul, and spirit. See, the problem is we want a miracle. God wants a healing. Like, we want this little condition or issue in our life fixed. God wants a comprehensive healing of your body, your soul, and your spirit. That's why the sin part plays into this. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So as we look at this passage of Scripture on healing, there's three observations as we dissect it that I want to share with you today. First off is God still heals people. God still heals people. When I was 22 years old, I was a young pastor at the Dream Center in Los Angeles and single, young, I was the youth pastor and we had these prayer meetings and there was a young couple that kept coming to the prayer meetings and, and they would always pray alone and one, one weekend they came and they asked me to pray with them. They, they wanted me to stand in agreement with them for something going on in their life and I said, what do you want me to pray for? She said, well, I can't get pregnant. I said, why? She goes, when I was a child, I had this sickness disease, and I had all my ovaries removed and taken out, and you know, I was 22. I didn't really understand what she was saying, so I just, you know, I said, well, you know, I know God can change the situation, and later on, I realized what an what a absolute miracle this was, because it was like physically impossible for her to get pregnant. Like, she didn't have any of the right, you know, equipment to, to see the thing happen. Like, <laughs> I mean, it was gone. It was removed, and so, I know that's a little graphic for you, but so I... 
you know, they, they, more than anything, they wanted to have a baby. And so I stood in agreement and I prayed with them. I said, God, you know, heal them and, and let them have a child and give them a baby. And this is what they want. And in the name of Jesus, and so we prayed. Well, a few months later, one of their friends came to church who grew up Jewish, but he wasn't a practicing Jew. And so he didn't really understand God or the power of God or healing or anything else. And it was at the end of one of our church services, and I was standing in the front praying with people, and there's like a crowd of people standing around. And remember, I'm single, young, pastor. He comes up all excited to meet me because he's heard about me. But, you know, again, he doesn't know what to say or how to say it. So he blurts out in front of the whole crowd of people, you got my friend's wife pregnant. (laughs) And I was like, I didn't get anybody pregnant, and I don't know your friend's wife. I mean, this is going to kill me. I was going to get fired over this thing. And so we finally cleared up the whole thing, come to find out what a miracle this was. I mean, it was, it was just a, a crazy miracle that, that God had done, all to say God still heals people. Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning what he did in the Bible, he's still doing, and he's going to still do it tomorrow. Then why doesn't it happen every time? Why doesn't every person I pray for get healed? I mean, to be very honest, if I was God, I would go down to children's hospital today and empty out every bedroom. See, here's the problem. Isaiah says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You see, that's the point. In your Christian journey, you're going to have to be okay with waiting for an answer. You're not going to know why to everything you want to know why to. In fact, that's why I believe one of the very first sounds you're going to hear in heaven, you know, a lot of people have these ideas of what heaven's going to be like, and you get there, hallelujah. I mean, just, you know, you come in the gates. I honestly believe the very first sound you're going to hear in heaven is, oh, oh. Because there's a lot of things that I want to know why to. And when I get there, I'm finally going to know. 1 John tells us that when we get to heaven, all things will be made clear, meaning it's not clear right now. Meaning you're not going to get all the answers you want right now. They don't call it faith for no reason. There's going to be parts you don't understand. Hebrews 11, the famous chapter on faith, talks about all these great men and women of faith. Towards the end of the chapter, the part that nobody likes, nobody reads, nobody studies, It talks about a whole other group of people. And here's what it says about them. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. So they had this great reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received. None of these people had their prayers answered. None of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind. It's not better in my mind. I'll tell you what's better in my mind. What's better in my mind is for God to do what I told him to do. That's what's better for me. Look, you've got you to understand this if you're going to understand healing for it to make sense. We're going to believe God for it, but we've got to trust him when it doesn't work out the way we want it to or we think it should. John Hovis, one of our prayer pastors, gave me this statement this week. We were talking about it. He says, you've got to expect without expectation. You expect God to show up and move every single time without an expectation on how he's going to do it. Because Isaiah 57, 1, a verse that's comforting and not so comforting at the same time, and I've got a lot of extra verses here that aren't in your notes. Good people pass away. Good people pass away. The godly often die before their time, at least in our mind. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil that is to come. You will drive yourself crazy if you try to put yourself in God's position and figure everything out. See, the truth is God still heals people. And the truth is God still doesn't. But they still get healed just another way. So we trust God every time we pray. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. He'll rescue me from sickness and disease. The Lord's gonna rescue me and the Lord will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Well, Paul, time out. Which is it? Is he rescuing me or he's bringing me? The answer is yes. 
Sometimes he rescues you, sometimes he brings you, so to him be glory forever and ever, amen. You see, here's the bigger picture. This is the why that, that James goes in the middle of a teaching on healing and the sickness, and he goes right into to a subject on sin and confession. Here's why, and, and this is why God uses a different Greek word at the beginning of James when he's talking about the sick person getting healed than he does at the end, a much deeper than just a physical healing. It's because God is more concerned about my soul. God is more concerned about my soul. Why? Because my body is not who I am. Even the life that I live is not really mine. I was bought with a price. My life is just a vapor. It's a mist. In fact, the whole point to me having this physical body and being on earth is it's a test. It's an opportunity for me to live as passionately as I can for Christ and the very short amount of time that I get and bring as many people with me as possible. That's what it's about. So I'm not who you see I am. Guess what? There's a person inside of here. And one day I'm gonna take this tent off and it's gonna rot in the ground and turn to dust and turn to ash and fall apart. But thank God this body is not who I am, but who I am is going to live on forever. My soul will go to heaven. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 10, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Look, if the best thing they can do is kill your body, like, if that's, if that's the best, like, if that's, that's the worst case scenario is it destroys your body. That's worst case. But it doesn't have the ability to touch your soul. You're good. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. See, the problem is you're thinking about earth and Jesus is thinking about heaven. There was a time where Jesus sent out all of the disciples two by two to all the surrounding villages, and he gave them this power and authority to go heal the sick and cast out demons. And they go out, and it actually happens, and they're freaking out. Like, this is amazing, Jesus. Like, people are getting healed, and demons are obeying us, and they're, they're leaving at our command, and they're all excited that this stuff is going on. And they come back to Jesus, like, fired up and telling him all the good news. And look at how Jesus responds to him. Do not rejoice that the Spirit submits you. That's not a big deal. That's not what you should be happy about. No, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Look, praise God that we still see miracles. Praise God that he still heals, but that's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle in your life is that your name is written in heaven because we're just passing through. We're just passing through. This is temporary. And I know, I'm like you, I don't like it. I don't like, I, I would rather God just do everything I told him to do. It would make my life a lot easier if he just obeyed me. But can I be honest, God is not quite as earth focused as we are. So what do we do? We still pray. But we focus on the real thing, which is eternity. So here's where I wanna spend the rest of the time. This is the real goal of today. God wants me to grow in faith. That's the third observation we get out of James. God wants me to grow in my faith. Look, we're focused on the miracle. We're focused on the healing. And this may hurt your feelings a little bit, but God is not as focused on that as you are. Because God's got something bigger in mind. He's looking at something much deeper. He's looking at a process that's going on in me during all of it. And if you don't understand that, you're gonna be frustrated. Because you're focused on the destination and God's focused on the journey. In other words, we're concerned about what's happening to us. God, save me. God, help me. And God's concerned about what's happening in us. Because there is a faith journey taking place. And you need to know that. So while we're going through what we're praying for, while we're going through these seasons where, where God is still at work in us, what do we do? Well, I've seen many people healed in, in my life. You know, I've prayed for many people, and I've seen many people healed. I've seen God show up and do supernatural miracles, and can I be honest with you? I've also prayed the same prayer for years for the same person. I think about a particular guy in our church every Sunday. Every Sunday, I get his prayer card, and it's the same physical condition for three years. I prayed the same prayer for the same person now for three years. 
You know, I think about our father-in-law last year. We prayed and prayed and prayed that God would heal him of cancer. God supernaturally heals our father-in-law of cancer. Doctors declared him medically free of cancer. Two months later, he dies in his sleep. Okay, so I've seen God show up and do incredible things, and then I've also prayed the same prayer over and over and over. So you ask the question, why doesn't God heal all the time? Why doesn't he just heal everyone? Why doesn't he answer every prayer? You want the answer? I'll give you the answer. Here it is. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that in the meantime, he's doing something inside of me, and I'm growing. It is a faith journey. I want you to remember, the series is called This Is That. It's not what you think. See, you think healing is about this. Healing isn't about this. It's actually about that. See, you think it's about the miracle. It's about the faith journey. It's about what's happening inside of you. That, that's what this is all about. Hebrews 11 says it like this, without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let me ask you, when do you seek God the most? When everything's going well or when you're in great need? See, the very next verse in this whole teaching on healing, James retells a story from the Old Testament. He says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, why does James, with two sentences, retell this story from the Old Testament? He's trying to show you a, a process, but you need a few more details to understand what he's trying to explain. This is a journey of Faith. So let's, let's look at it and let's pull out the details so we understand this journey of faith that applies to our healing and understanding of healing. 1 Kings 17, now Elijah the Tishbite, this is the story that James was retelling from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, Ahab was a wicked, evil king in the Old Testament. He says to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. You see, Elijah had a word from God. God gave him this message, this word, this prophetic word to turn Ahab from his wicked ways. Ahab was a wicked, evil king. Elijah was prophesying so that he would repent, he would turn his life around, and he would surrender to God. This shows us, number one, faith begins with a word from God. Faith begins with a word from God. You cannot grow in your faith journey if God has not spoken something inside of you, a word to you. Paul puts it like this in Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing. So to have faith, it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes through a word from God. Now, to understand this, you have to understand the Greek language. The Greek language is very descriptive. They have many more words in Greek than we have in the English language. So this word, word, in the Greek, it has a little confusing, the word, word, in the Greek, there's actually two different Greek words it could be. Throughout the New Testament, there were two Greek words that would translate into the one English word, word. There's the Greek word logos. Logos is the written word of God. That's the Bible that we read, logos. Then there's a Greek word called rhema. Rhema is when God speaks personally to you. It's, it's, it's the personal word of God. So there's the written word of God that's available to all of us. Then there's a rhema word where God speaks directly to you. This Greek word is rhema. The problem is if you interpret this Greek word as logos, which many people have done, you get a very legalistic doctrine. The reason God's not answering your prayer is because you're not reading the Bible enough. You're not praying enough. You're not doing enough. You're not working hard enough. If you did more, God would listen to you, but that's not what this is. This is rhema. This is a personal word. So let me explain it like this. Logos tells you what God can do. When you read the Bible, you, sh you see what God has the potential to do. What this does is gives you hope where you can pray a prayer of hope because you know God has the ability to do it. God has the power to pull this off because it's in the Bible. So Logos gives you hope. Logos tells you what God can do. Rhema tells you what God will do. There's a difference. 
See, logos gives you hope, rhema gives you faith. Logos tells you what God has the ability to pull off. Rhema is God saying, this is what I'm going to do. That's why Hebrews says, faith is the confidence. It's the confidence that what I'm hoping for, what I know God has the ability to do is actually gonna happen in my life. Well, what makes me confident that what I'm hoping for is actually gonna happen, Rhema? When God says, this is what I'm gonna do in your life, now I can be confident. Now I can pray a prayer of faith that is powerful, that is effective because I've heard from God. Now, logos is critical to the process because here's how it works in my life. So often I'll be reading logos I'll be doing my one-year Bible in the morning, reading the Bible, and then all of a sudden, God will take one phrase, one verse, and he will breathe it into my spirit. Now, now again, I know that freaks some of you out. I can't intellectually help you figure that one out. It's something you've got to experience. But there are times I'm reading Logos, and it becomes rhema to me. Like, all of a sudden, it comes off the page into my spirit, and it becomes very personal, and all of a sudden, my faith becomes active in that area. And now I can move in faith like, like I couldn't do before. So this is powerful. So watch what happens. Now, this is chapter 18. This is three and a half years later. Now, if it doesn't rain, Elijah's a false prophet. He's going to get stoned. So he says, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. It's like, it's been three and a half years. There's been no rain. It's got to rain now. And his servant went and looked, and his servant came back and said, there's nothing there. I don't know how many times in my life I've prayed and there's nothing there. Like, I don't see anything. Like, God, where are you? God, what are you up to? Because I don't see you right now. There's nothing there. So Elijah said, seven times, go back. But Elijah, there's nothing there. Go back. Elijah, there's nothing there. Go back. Elijah, there's nothing there. Go back. I'm waiting for these two words to get in somebody's spirit today. I don't know about you, but typically God never answers my prayer the first time. Because if he did, I wouldn't go back. And God likes the going back. God likes the closeness he has with me when I seek him. And honestly, if God answered every prayer I prayed the first time, I probably wouldn't talk to him much. To be very honest with you, so the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab. No, 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 Elijah, I don't know if you heard me correctly. It's just the size of a man's hand. It's not a very big cloud, Elijah. Like it's not a thunder cloud. The sky's not gray. It's, it's this tiny little cloud you can see out over the sea. It's just about the big as a man's hand. Yeah, go tell Ahab, God's on the move. God's showing up. The miracle is about to happen. Number two, faith continues regardless of what I see. Faith continues regardless of what I see. That's why 2 Corinthians says, we walk by faith, not by sight. I, I don't live my life according to what I see with these eyes. I live my life according to what I see with these eyes. I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. I believe by faith. I live by faith. But here, here, here's the question. What do we do in the meantime? What, what, what do I do while there's nothing there? What, what do I do when I'm not seeing anything? Hebrews tells us, do not throw away this confident trust. Look, when you don't see anything, don't throw away your confident trust. Go back. Go back. Well, there's nothing there. Go back. There's nothing there. Go back. I've been going back for 10 years. Go back again. It's been 15 years. Go back again. Don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward It'll bring you. It will bring you a great reward. Patient endurance is what you need now. No, it's not. What I need right now is God to answer my prayer. <laughs> no, what you need right now is patient endurance so that you will continue to do God's will. You'll continue to go back. You'll continue to seek him. Then you will receive all that he has promised you. For in just a little while, and I got some really bad news for you today. That little while is God's little while, not your little while. Remember the Bible says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day? Like that, that's just not good news. <laughs> the coming one will come and not delay and my righteous ones will live by faith. Again, it's all about faith. So let's see how this story ends. 
Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. So it began to pour. Like exactly as Elijah prayed, it began to happen. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, tucking his cloak into his belt. He ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, that is a physical impossibility. A human being should not outrun a chariot full of horses. This is a physical miracle that takes place. Elijah outruns on foot a chariot full of horses. God did the miracle, but what I want you to notice is it went beyond expectation. When God shows up, it always goes beyond He'll always do more than you expected him to do. It'll always be greater than you thought it was going to be. When we trust God and don't doubt, look, I will wait as long as it takes because God will always do more than what I imagine when he shows up. So number three, faith goes from a small beginning to a grand finale. And he does this every single time. But if I can be honest with you, it's the small beginning part of the faith journey that we all despise, don't we? I don't like the small beginnings. I like the end. Like I am an end in mind person. I don't want the journey. But can I tell you, God is not a destination person or God is a journey person. He's all about the journey. And I don't know if this will comfort you or not, but I promise you when you get to heaven, I promise you. And I know this is gonna be hard for some of you to accept right now especially in the middle of what you're going through. You've been fighting in prayer for years. You've been asking God for years. And you're confused and, and, you're, and, and you're, your mind is hurting over this thing because you don't understand why God's doing what he's doing and why he's not showing up the way you want him to show up. I promise you, trust me on this. When you get to heaven and God shows you what's going on, your reaction is gonna be, oh, God, God, You did it exactly the way you should have. God, you you knew. You were right. I was wrong. It's exactly the way it should have been. I promise you that's going to be a reaction. And I know it doesn't feel like it right now. And I know it's not a whole lot of comfort to you. But I promise you that's going to be a reaction. But unless you understand this, you're not going to understand healing. The journey is going to be miserable. Zechariah says, do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. I want to see the work end, to be very honest. God, God's like happy about the beginning. Like, I just, I want the end. Like, just give me the miracle. See, Paul even wrestled with this. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he says, three different times I begged the Lord. This is the apostle Paul. Wrote half the New Testament. Crying out to God in prayer time and time and time again, and God's not answering his prayer. I mean, did you get that there? Like, this is Paul. Three times I'm begging God in prayer God, do a miracle. God, take it away. God, show up. And each time God said, Look, Paul, my grace is all you need. You'll be okay. I'm not gonna do it the way you want me to do it, Paul. My grace is all you need. In fact, my power works best in your weakness. Paul, I'm gonna get more glory out of it this way. So what is Paul's response? So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Look, God God didn't do it the way I wanted him to do it. I'm gonna boast about it. I'm gonna boast about it so that the power of Christ can work through me. If you want to understand faith and you want to understand healing, the process is the point. The process you're in, that's the point. See, again, you thought it was this, but it's actually that. It's not the miracle, it's the process. It's not the healing, it's the journey. It's all about 